Yes, uh, I would like to convince you today that a lot of the idea of, uh, of a research program, scientific, philosophical research program, sometimes he uses that phrase as well, can be fruitfully exploited for uh, an interpretation of Scottish Enlightenment philosophical scientific enterprises uh, in, in, a very, well, in, a, in a very fruitful way. Because if we use this heuristic centered understanding of research program that I'm going to sketch very soon, uh, then you will be able to see how those people back then, uh, in the Scottish Enlightenment, independently of whether they were working in natural philosophy or moral philosophy or medical theory or political economy, they saw themselves as being part of the same enterprise. There was no divide back then between the two cultures, as we know from C.P. Snow. Uh, they were, well, not just discussing the same ideas and sitting at the same dinner tables, but they launched journals together, scholarly societies together, and they were, well, attending to the same, well, conferences, if you, if you wish. Uh, Lakatosh's idea of a research can also reveal disciplinary interconnections between these various fields, natural and moral philosophy, both broadly understood moral philosophy, so as to do political economy, and proto-social sciences and natural philosophy so as to medical theory are uh, pra more practical and philosophically inclined parts of chemistry as well. Uh, so with this background, we can offer a, a sort of co coherent narrative of the Scottish Enlightenment that's able to present uh, these various intellectual philosophy enterprises in a synoptic view and it can deliver, if you look at the Scottish Enlightenment from this angle, it can deliver new, insight, new insights about individual achievement. So today I'm going to sketch, as you will see, four research programs in the Scottish Enlightenment, and I'm going to illustrate how putting David Hume in one of them can shed a, a, a new light on, on him that might be perhaps interesting to philosophers in general, not just for historians of science. Uh, what Lopatosh means by a research program uh, is not entirely clear. Sometimes it is defined in terms of, uh, or, 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 of, of, of propositions, as a set of universal and irrefutable propositions. But sometimes it is defined in terms of heuristic, as powerful problem-solving machinery. Uh, a major apparatus whose function is to deal with facts, depending on where he uh, well, where, where, where and when he uh, discusses these, these terms. Uh, there are basically three options that one can, uh, uh, one can take with respect to the relation of, uh, of, uh, of hardcore and heuristics and, and methodology in, in, in this context. Either one can say, referring to some Lakatoshian tags, that it is the heuristics that defines um, a research program because the Copernican problem, program was not further developed by Kepler, Galileo, and Newton, despite the fact that the Copernican hardware had been adopted by them. Yet they represent a different research program according to this block uh, of questions. As uh, he's more inclined to identify research programs in terms of their propositional hardcores, and sometimes he just says that there is a conventional distinction here. I'm not going to uh, argue for either of these approaches. I'm just, just going to well, stipulate that one. Well, I'm just going to use the heuristic centered understanding of a, of a research program now for the purposes of this tool. <coughs> so with this background, uh, I suggest that there are full research programs that are discernible in the Scottish Enlightenment. Uh, the one is a Principia-inspired research program consisting of a combination of a priori typical mathematical framework for processing empirical facts, a commitment to an ontology whose components are quantifiable. There is an optics-inspired research program with comparative analogical reasoning sensitive to proportionality and qualitative differences. And there is a research program founded on common sense principles and it inquires into subjects of both moral and natural philosophy. These programs, they, I mean, uh, 
participants in these programs, or contributors to these programs, uh, consider themselves as Newtonian in <coughs> one sense or another. And one can be uh, perhaps more charitable to, to them than, than Lockhart was to, to the Newtonian extensions of, to the extensions of Newtonianism into, into more distant fields like, uh, like uh, more, more dis fields more distant from, from physics, like, like physiology or ethics. And there is also a fourth program, which is more Baconian, uh, which is a research program inspired by the descriptive and classificatory approach of natural history, is Baconian natural, natural history, and not so much characterized by explanatory uh, 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 aspirations, or theoretical aspirations, it's description and classification. Right? Uh, I also am inclined to suggest that methodologies the methodologies these different figures take, they reflect different epistemic ideals. That is, normative commitments to what inquiry should aspire to achieve. Uh, and they consider methodologies as prescriptions as to how to achieve. And these are uh, uh, epistemic ideals as reflected in methodologies are frequently in the background of theoretical differences and controversies. They both methodologies and epistemic ideals, they receive philosophical expressions, declarations, typically, and also practical manifestations in inferential practices. Uh, they also provide orientation and limitation for, for the inquiry. They orient the questions and that to be asked and answers to be sought for, and also limit the attention, constrain the attention of uh, those contributing to these enterprises, making them less sensitive to alternative approaches, questions, and answers. Uh, there are certain, I'm not going to dwell into this, there are certain common elements, common especially uh, among the three, these three programs in the Scottish Enlightenment, less so in the Baconian one, uh, that are characteristics, char characteristic to these programs, inductivism, experimentalism in one form or another, and the speculative, speculative that is anti-Cartesian, Leibnizian tendencies, uh, an inclination to set explicit rules for experimentation, reasoning, and classification, uh, some kind of commitment some, to some kind of analysis, but what they mean by analysis is that, that can be radically different. And there is one uh, point that I'm not going to dwell on, but rather interesting, uh, out of the three, out of the four research programs, they are all, the, the, the contributors are all typically committed to some kind of providential naturalism, meaning that they want to read off uh, transcendent lessons from, uh, from nature, some kind of, uh, some, some lesson with religious significance, with theological significance. One research program which is not so much inclined in that direction is the optics inspired one as you will see. Uh, and that's going to be reflected in the epistemic ideal that they pursue. Okay, let's take a look at the Principia inspired research program first. Um, I'll give a short, but uh, not short, not so short, a list of names that are contribute, that contributed to, to these research programs. I'm not going to discuss them in detail. But they are all committed to some kind of demonstrative certainty, even in empirical methods. They, believe that that's achievable, typically uh, through the combination of mathematical methods and empirical observation. And they also believe that providential knowledge from the study of nature is achievable. Uh, they are following the Newtonian style, as I.D. Graham termed it, meaning that there is mathematical representation everywhere, not just in physics, but in chemistry, physiology, and ethics as well. Uh, they also follow a, 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 a way of inquiry through successive approximations. They start from an idealized situation, uh, um, a, a fairly simplistic one, and from that situation they proceed towards real, more complex situations. Sometimes they are not so much mathematical, then, but there is even that in Turnbull's case. Uh, there is an a priori framework for processing empirical material. He calls his approach, he calls his approach mixed 
moral philosophy, uh, following the, the, the term or inspired by the term mixed natural philosophy, or mixed mathematics, which is mathematics mixed with experimentation and observation. And of course, they typically have a kind of affinity for mechanical ontologies, because mechanical ontology presents a world that's more easily quantifiable or approachable by mathematical means than a world of qualitative differences. Uh, there is a philosophical declaration by James Kael from a work on animal secretion and muscular motion. He says, that many phenomena of the animal body which the ages past thought inexplicable have now by several been made the subjects of geometrical demonstration and many things still remain undiscovered is not that of their own nature they are less capable of demonstration but that the data are not sufficient we are not yet fully appraised of all the circumstances which can use to produce such phenomena that's a declaration but that's the that's the <coughs> this is style or manner in which Keel follows his uh, 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 or, or, or explains his uh, uh, his discoveries with respect to animal secretion and muscular motion. But there is this uh, Hutch and Hutchison's uh, uh, attempt to introduce a universal moral calculus. Uh, his, he begins with benevolence and he compares it explicitly to gravity, which, and it is also a calculable universal force, except it's a social force. It is always directly as the moment of good produced in like circumstances and inversely as their abilities. And then he goes on, as you can see, uh, this kind of uh, this kind of exposition, but not after the subsequent editions. This is just the first edition of the book. After 1725, those the following editions, he he drops uh, this uh, attempt at a universal moral calculus, uh, and that indicates pretty much whether uh, the program ends or dies, uh, typically because people like George Cheney, for example, who aspired to write a Principia Medicinae on mathematical grounds, he realizes that that's not going to work for problems of living matter. Because they realize, even if they try to calculate the force the, the stomach contributes to, to digestion, they make calculations in that direction, they realize that it's not a mechanical process. Digestion is not a mechanical process, so they cannot really represent it by uh, the means of mathematical natural philosophy. Uh, same with uh, a chemical phenomena, that qualitative dis uh, 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 distinctions and differences are involved. This mathematical representation doesn't work. And same uh, in ethics, we as a nice essay on quantity, uh, he explains that well, mathematical methods cannot be applied to all things capable of more or less, but only to things measurable by lines and numbers. Everywhere else, mathematical representation is only to bring really changes upon words and to make a show of mathematical reasoning without advancing one step in real knowledge. And there are also external causes, because one in, uh, uh, inspiration behind adopting mathematical methods was an aspiration to avoid conflict, to avoid controversy. And mathematics was thought to be a nice way of avoiding that. I mean, a clear mathematical demonstration that should be compulsory uh, to everyone. But then, responding to the leibniz newton controversy, Pitkin realized in the early 18th century that even Newton's Principia can be barbarously, orangically, and Hanoverianly abused. I love that phrase. <laughs> And also, uh, arguably, Britain in the 18th century lacked the sufficient mathematical genius to extend this program further, as opposed to France, for example, or, or Germany. Uh, okay, now the optics-inspired program. Uh, uh, it also includes chemists and physiologists like Colin Black, Joseph Black, uh, chemistry, Hume, Miller, Smith, James Hutton and others as well. They have a, a fallible uh, 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 epistemic ideal which aspires not to demonstrative certainty, not to demonstration, not to certainty, aspires to useful and satisfactory knowledge by satisfactory 
That's a term I take from Hume. I, 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 it can be pl plausibly understood as kind of empirical adequacy. That's, that's what we are aspiring. Truth is too much to be hoped for, as, as Hume says at one point. And that's the spirit in which Hume writes his science of man, Colin, his chemistry, uh, uh, which is, uh, <coughs> actually, Colin thinks that chemistry has basically three uh, aims to, to achieve. One is to describe the properties of substances, uh, to induce new properties in substances, and to create new substances. But these are practical, uh, with, 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 an, with an eye on, on practical utility and not so much on the intelligibility of nature. And same with Smith's political economy. If one reads the, the Wealth of Nations, then one will find that this contains more uh, advice to actual policy than abstract dispositions into, uh, into uh, economic matters. Uh, Okay, this comes hand in hand with, uh, with a kind of epistemic humility. They don't uh, uh, aspire to demonstrative certainty. Lavatosh's charge is not something that can be applied to this form of Newtonianism. And this epistemic humility is nicely reflected in, in a change of terminology in Hume, between Hume's treatise and the, and the first inquiry. Uh, in, 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 the, in the treatise, he makes a distinction between those distinction between knowledge, proof, and probability. Uh, knowledge being demonstrated knowledge. The only kind of knowledge that deserves this label is demonstrating knowledge. He accepts that, but in the in the inquiry, he changes that to demonstration, proof, and probability. And then from then onwards, it makes sense in, 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 the, in the human's context to talk about degrees of knowledge. In the treatise, knowledge is still, is, is still uh, reserved for, for demonstrating. Um, okay, I'm not, I would like to spend some time on Hume, so I'm going to speed up a bit. Uh, these are, uh, are the central features of this uh, methodology. It's comparative, uh, has qualitative sensitivity. In, instead of developed or refined, Mathematics, they uh, focus on proportionality only, uh, and are inclined to towards taxonomic and diagrammatic representations, especially in chemistry. One can think of the uh, affinity tables that uh, came into fashion in the early 18th century. Okay, I'm going to skip this. Um, there is also a common sense phase. Uh, research program which retains the uh, demonstrative ideal of knowledge and also aspires for providential knowledge. Uh, this is the two main representatives are Thomas Reed and John Robison. Uh, I think Robison is more uh, interesting here because he thinks that Newton's laws, that is the first two laws of motion, can be deduced a priori from common sense principles. Because the first law is basically a reformulation of every change is an effect, which is a common sense truth. Uh, common sense truth being, truth is being, ha ha ha, uh, da, 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 da. first principles, principles of common sense, common notions, self evident truth is, truth is that no one in his or her right mind would question. And no one in his or her right mind would question that every change is an effect. Uh, according to Robbins. Also, the second law, Newton's second law, can be deduced from causes are to be measured by the degree of change following them. That's also a common sense. Now, viewed from this angle, we get a rather Kantian perspective on, uh, on Newtonian natural philosophy uh, because Newton's laws will be the laws, uh, are constituting features of the world for us. Not out there, but it's just for us, which uh, uh, means that our natural philosophy is not about uh, things out there in the world, but it's about our thinking about uh, those things and not, not, the, not the world. Okay, so that's the common sense style. 
naturalists are going to dwell on this even less because it's intellectual, not as arousing. Uh, they aspire for descriptive knowledge and classification, primarily for providential interpretation and for moral instruction. For them, uh, inquiry, that's I think the most important inquiry, natural inquiry included, is subsuming to the purposes of moral education. It's not knowledge for its own sake, not knowledge for making uh, the world intelligible or producing useful knowledge, it's knowledge for for, for moral improvement. Okay. Now, what if we, what can we say about Hume's place in, in the optics inspired research program? Especially because Hume is, as we can see it here, typically placed in the Principia uh, tradition. Everyone thinks about, almost everyone, thinks about. Uh, the principles of association as analogues of Newton's gravity. This passage, here's a kind of attraction which in the mental world will be found to have as extraordinary effects as in the natural and to show itself in as many and as various forms. Its effects are ever that conspicuous, but as to its causes, they are <coughs> mostly unknown and must be resolved in the original point of human nature which I've talked to. Almost everyone takes this uh, as an allusion to to Newton's gravity. But one could be suspicious because gravity is not something that has extraordinary effects in very small. Gravity has just the same effect everywhere in the world. And not very extraordinary and not certainly not in various forms. But if one thinks that this might be a reference to uh, elective attractions, elective affinities or reference, that is, central terms in then contemporary chemistry, then I think it, especially in you know, the fact that principles of association, uh, well, there are three of them, and they have different effects on different perceptions. So that's, uh, that's, it doesn't look like gravity. It looks more like, more like an elective uh, attraction between various uh, perceptions. Now, Again, this, against this background, I would suggest that read the first uh, uh, sections of, uh, of, the, of the treatise, as he himself says, as elements of his philosophy, meaning that he presents perceptions and principles by which to analyze those perceptions. It's kind of Cartesian empiricism. It begins with uh, perceptions. He says that there are impressions and ideas. This is a part that you cannot really get outside of. You cannot really question uh, meaningfully that there are perceptions. And then you analyze that transition and transformation, so you get the principles, and analyze their composition, and then you get the nature of perceptions and ideas. That's already, I mean, these aspirations are there in the introduction of the treatise. It's typical not to pay attention to the nature of ideas. There, uh, there is a positive heuristic that uh, one can find in Hume, namely that the empirical that consists in the empirical deduction of apparently non-empirical concepts, contents. Sorry, that's what happens with respect to a very important concept idea of causation, but we get that problem already with the missing shade of blue experiment, uh, experiment uh, thought experiment, I'm going to return to that very soon. And also, let's try to find that some support of positive heuristics, excellent reduction of various processes of transition and transformation in the human mind, that is, I'll try to explain everything in terms of hand in terms of handful of principles, the three principles of association are important, very important there, but we'll see uh, a copy principle and sympathy, they might play a, a, a different non associative role there. And also his better negative heuristics as to how to avoid uh, challenges addressed to the, either to the methodological heart or to some central claims in revised means. That's what he does with Terms, substance, faculty, and several others, and 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 those uh, terms or aspects of meaning that resist this revision are proclaimed to be 
nonsense. So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm, yes. Uh, so I suggest to read Hume in this context, this context of uh, the principalist, compositionalist, uh, the uh, attention in chemistry, which is a uh, characteristic the 18th century chemistry uh, a, a conflict from which compositionalists are, well, came, came out as winners. Uh, okay, I'm not going to develop that because then I'm going to uh, run out of time completely. Uh, okay, Hume's program is predominantly a problem of causal analysis in this side. Phenomenology is merely the starting point. In the advertisement of the treatise, one can read that the first two books of the treatise, they make for a complete chain of reasoning. While commentators, and well, if we give a, an introductory class in view, then we typically stop uh, by characterizing uh, impressions and ideas. We stop at the false line in SYSity distinction, uh, as impressions are less lively, uh, more lively, forceful, and vivacious ideas are faint copies of that. And then that's typically we are satisfied with this with this phenomenological distinction. But then if we if we go on, then we find that ideas and impressions, their important properties are causal properties, not their phenomenal properties. Uh, like we may draw inferences from the coherence of perceptions, whether they be true or false, whether they represent nature justly, or be mere, mere illusions of the senses. The reference of the idea to an object being an external de de denomination, of which in itself there is no mark or pattern, or even more pressing. One impression may be related to another, when their impulses or directions are similar and correspond to It's not the present sensation alone. So it's not phenomenological resonance that matters, but causal, and he repeats it. And that comes through very clearly with respect to the calm passions. So it's the causal form. It looks like Hume's... Uh, the, uh, the product of Hume's experimental reasoning is a causal theory of content. It's not resonance and not copying that matters here, but the causal rule that uh, perceptions can play. And then we get this also as a result of experimental reasoning, which says that ideas may be, well, I'm not going to read, you can read this. The point is that this passage indicates a real difference in kind, because it says that impressions and ideas have different compositional properties. Impressions can combine so as to lose their identity, they may lose themselves. Ideas can only combine as Lego uh, pieces. Uh, it also means that impressions have no canonical decomposition, and uh, these properties can only be real from the causal analysis, not phenomenology. Uh, and why I'm referring to the missing shade of blue, that if there was no difference like this between impressions and ideas, then the missing shade of blue would not be a problem. Because if ideas had the same properties as impressions do, then we just could take two ideas and blend them together, blend perfectly, blend them perfectly together, and then we could get the missing shade. But given that ideas are Lego-like, we cannot do that. And here is an even more revolting passage, and this is the final one, uh, where he says basically that color and form, if we, have a, if we, if we look at a white globe, white marble globe, irrespective of any other potential or actual experience, if we look at the white marble globe, then its color and form are the same. They are, there's no difference between color and form. How is it that we get to distinguish them? It's due to different sets of resonances. Once we uh, encounter black marble cubes, no, black, black marble, black marble, black 
marble globes and white marble cubes, then we will be able to establish different uh, resonances here. And that's how we get these seemingly simple ideas of uh, form and color. Now, this suggests that this perfect blending that Hugh mentions here with respect to impressions is already there you know, in, in, in our experience. And what gives, uh, well, form, what, the, what, what gives structure to this experience is an activity of the mind. So, what we have, and this is the final last slide, uh, we have, in Hume's case, subpersonal and subfenomenal processes explored from phenomenal, uh, uh, phenomenal properties of experience, uh, a primacy of causal properties revealed from comparative analysis, quasi-chemical transformations of perceptions, active contribution of the faculties, structuring it, and the end product is Hume as a faculty psychologist instead of an arch associationist. So that's what we can get if we recontextualize Q uh, uh, against the background of these different research programs. And I think similarly interesting results can be uh, achieved with Adam Smith, William Kahn, and others as well. So thank you for your.